Switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about grain sorghum. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of interest in this topic the last couple of years. It seems to be falling off some this year because of commodity prices and so forth. But who knows? It's kind of hard to get a, a good futures price on this. We had a, a big meeting with the National uh, Sorghum Checkoff Board last week. They seemed pretty optimistic that there would be some pretty good price support You know, before we get into planning. Who, who knows? It's too early to tell. Uh, nevertheless, there will be some people that grow grain sorghum regardless. So acres will fluctuate, I think, widely um, in our area uh, because we have the ability to switch a lot of crops and take advantage of commodity prices no matter what it is. So it will come back, but when it comes back, there, of course, now with the sugarcane aphid, uh, there's some things that, that are important to know going into this. Uh, I get asked all the time, and I'm not going to concentrate 100% on, on sugarcane aphids, but of course, we'll talk about that a lot. Uh, we have other issues. A lot of people are not are thinking, hey, I don't want to go gr grow grain sorghum because of sugarcane aphids. Honestly, I don't think that's a, a good reason. If you look, Lauren and I were talking about this uh, b before the meeting, and, I, and I'm not familiar with all the state's independent budgets, but I'm sure, I'm sure they're very similar. <coughs> if you look at our, our enterprise budget uh, that our economists put out at Mississippi State, and if you look at all the commodities, actually grain sorghum at 450 and 100 bushels is the only one that really pencils out pretty good now that's you know that's for that yield gold and that price which which we were above that last year on some contracts so it is a good crop and it does provide just like lauren said uh an ability to switch herbicides which is a big deal and we all a lot of people have marginal acres and it fits that really well and it's a great nematode uh, so it has a fit the acres we grow will, will fluctuate, obviously, for, from year to year. But going into this thing, I only put this in here. I'm not going to spend any time really talking about chinch bugs, except to say a few years back, we pretty much got away from seed treatments in grain sorghum as a, as a standard or an automatic with the seed companies. And the reason that we did that mainly was because you can plant half the world with a bag of grain sorghum, and there was a huge sticker shock for our growers. And when they price that bag, even though you're getting whatever, 10 acres, whatever you, your seeding rate is, out of a bag, it was a, a pretty big sticker shock. So people were opting out. So therefore, about the only crop we were treating chinch bugs in was grain sorghum. And it was on the acres where we didn't have, have seed treatments. Seed treatments are more important today than they've ever been. It is an absolute must, in my opinion, in grain sorghum, because we're seeing 35, 40 days break before you have to start treating sugarcane aphids. The seed treatments are phenomenal for sugarcane aphids, of course, throughout uh, till they till they start dissipating. So it's a must in today's environment. And in fact, I know Pioneer and, and I think Decal. It's back to standard. Uh, if you order, you're going to get probably Concept and, and a seed treatment. We're not seeing big differences whether it's Cruiser or uh, Poncho-based clothane and thymotoxin. They both seem to be performing. But it's a must in today's in today's environment. On a side note. There has not been a lot of work on the value of seed treatments in grain sorghum over the years with, with sugarcane aphids not in the picture. So we have a grad student that's actually working on that, and we got to about 12 or 15 trials in the last couple years. In the absence of sugarcane aphids, where we're just spraying the heck out of it, trying to keep them out to evaluate the benefits of the seed treatment themselves, we're somewhere around seven bushel advantage in grain sorghum. Don't quote me a lot on that, but the last numbers I looked at, so there's an advantage either way. So keep that in mind. Um, the seed treatments are a hot topic right now for a lot of reasons, particularly some of the, the pollinator things. I would really encourage y'all at this next session to go. Scott Stewart's in here. He's going to be in room two, but he's going to be addressing uh, some of the issues that we're facing uh, right now in the industry as related to pollinators, and, and that'll be a good open discussion, I think, going into it. Now, mid is something that, you know, this, is, this has always been, honestly, my biggest concern in grain sorghum, uh, sorghum midge. The problem is it don't occur on every acre. And on a once a week check, it sometimes, if, you, if you're on a once a week check, can, can be somewhat of an issue because a grain sorghum head, I'll show you in just a minute, uh, can pollinate out in between your checks. So essentially, we've always, because they're so damaging, We've always just really recommended an automatic one or two shot midge application of a cheap pyrethroid. And it's worked well, and we've never really fought that recommendation. 
because if you don't control this one, it can be done. The last two years, I can show you 100% yield loss fields to Mitch. Now, they're few and far between, but they're there. And it, even on the earlier planted stuff. In fact, at Stoneville, the earliest planted stuff has been getting hit the worst. 100% yield loss in some places. So we need to control this one, but it's easy to control. You just need somebody looking at it. You see these blanked heads. This is very common um, that we see sometimes. Let me see if I can can show you all something here. This is a field. This is a field. Uh, from this past year. This is a really weird screen. I'm not seeing what you're seeing. <laughs> that's why that's why I'm trying to, to show you this. I gotta get down here on a second. It's worth the wait. So this is a this is one of our one of our plot fields last year. What this is is this is midge, and you can see there's not a lot of damage. This was field was sprayed for midge, but this is when they were emerging out. This is just showing you what we missed, and we have other examples, some pictures from Stoneville, and you see the little the little midge. This is sorghum midge, all of this, but this is like I said, coming out uh, what's emerging out of some of the heads that we miss. So mids are around. They typically are way worse on your later planted stuff. Uh, but I just thought that's a pretty good visual. Gives you an idea of something about the size and so forth. But it's a pretty good visual on uh, what went through, even with, with good scouting. So we do need to be, a, be aware of, of that. Thank you. Yes? It looks to me like you literally you only missed the very tip of the... Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. And that's common too. That, that's very common. That's just a shot of a midge. Um, but one of the things going into this, this last year when we actually had a pretty big midge problem in the state of Mississippi, depending on where you was at, one of the things that we found out with the increase in grain sorghum acres, really there are a lot of people who didn't really know or have the confidence in scouting midge. And uh, they're really not that difficult to scout. Uh, you can take a gallon bag I don't really, I usually just visual, but you can take a gallon Ziploc bag, you don't even really have to be careful. Just drop it over the head and thump that neck and they'll flutter up in there and you can look and you can find them very easy. Our threshold is one per head. I'm not saying I wouldn't get a little aggressive if I caught half per head on average on certain areas of the field because the damage, the damage at one per head if you let it go through is typically 10 to 20 percent uh, from the literature. But the one thing that we were really having trouble educating people on is when midge or when sorghum is, is vulnerable to midge. That's the thing. We're, we're, we're flowering from the top down about 20 to 25% a day. So in four to five days, that head is over. If you have orange flowers, you see this right here, this yellow, this is the top of the head. This is about, looks like about 30% if you figure the size of that head. That's about where we make that first midge shot, right? The yellow anthers is the key. That's when it's vulnerable to midge. That female midge lays an egg in each of those glooms when they open and stick that anther out. This is when it's vulnerable. Once it gets past that and that anther dies and that gloom closes, this part of the head is no longer susceptible to midge damage. A lot of people just didn't know this. And the reason this is important, we had a lot of fields sprayed after it was past the point of getting midge. We had some fields sprayed at soft dough. You have a small window to get them, a very small window. That is why it's critical to have somebody, a consultant or somebody, looking at this on a very regular basis. The reason this is more important now, if you make just an indiscriminate pyrethroid application for midge, you really have the ability to, to blow up the sugarcane aphids quicker. I'm not saying they're not going to blow up anyway, but when you kill those few lady beetles or whatever's out there, it goes quicker. But again, it flowers down, and that, that this one right here, this is the only part of that head. This is three to four days later that is vulnerable at this time. So that is the critical, critical stage. Is there any questions about that? You can do it. Now, the problem you're going to run into is when you feel heads erratically. That's a problem. I understand that. It always happens for the most part. Very few feel. Yes, sir? How long is it between the first and the third picture? 
that's about three days. Actually, in that field, it was taken on the same day because I just found some heads that come out a little early for the picture. But at about, if it's 20 to 25% a day, you're talking about four to five days before an individual head completely flowers out. So it's not long with the varieties we're growing. Some of the older stuff could be as much as eight or nine days, but typically with what we're growing is four to five days what we're seeing. But if you got uneven head emergence, you might have to make a, a second application. Here's another big mistake that I saw last year. To try to make one application, we had a lot of growers last year that missed midge on the first 50% of the field because they wanted the whole field to be in bloom when they did it. In other words, they, and they didn't even realize they were sacrificing that part of the head. So if you waited five days, you could miss 50%. You could blink the first 50% of the head out in order to save one application. Really, you gotta make a two application if the, midge is, if the midge are in the field. So uneven head emergence is obviously a problem. But this is a very important pest that gets overlooked now because of sugarcane aphids. The only thing I'm really gonna say on this headworm complex uh, is it's a, it's a problem in the Mid-South area. Super, super easy to scout for. We've almost exclusively moved to the diamides for control, Prevathon and Besiege particularly. Belt, we've had some issues with Belt, I'm not gonna lie. It does okay. If you didn't have Prevathon or Besiege, it'd probably be a, a really good choice compared to them. It just hasn't stacked up as well the last few years. So uh, it is an option, but it hasn't performed as well as those two. Keep in mind, Besiege has a pyrethroid in it. Could flare you if it's quicker. It's still a good option. You just need to be aware of those things. Our thresholds that we're using are one worm per head, whether it's a fall or a corn earworm. It don't matter. Count them together. With sorghum webworms, which have been getting worse the last few few years, it's been uh, uh, five about five per head, roughly. It depends on states, four to six. So it takes more of them. Pyrethroids are not even in our, our recommendations in any way for any of these pests anymore. We just have, don't get good luck with them. Um, I will say Blackhawk, we had some pretty good luck with the, with the headworm complex with Blackhawk last year. I'll be honest, we're, you know, there was a big push for Blackhawk for sorghum midge. It's not going to flare the, the aphids. We're not in any state right now in the Mid-South, you will not see Blackhawk as a recommendation for a sorghum midge. Our results are just, they're all over. We're not going to recommend it. We're not comfortable with that recommendation yet and our, our data would support our position. So you take that how you want, but it's not going to be in our recommendations. I'm not recommended in my area, I'm not recommending chlorpyrifos or dimethylate. They're okay, but they're not good. Even though it will flare aphids, if you really have midge, I'm still recommending real low rates of pyrethroid. We deal with one problem at a time. That's just my recommendation. All right, I'm gonna move into this aphid. Everybody knows about it. All right, here's your sugarcane aphids. We've always had corn leaf aphids in the fields. And you'll see one plant that's just ravaged but it never gets bad, really. One or two here and there. This one, of course, is a game changer. It gets bad, and it gets bad quick, and it scares some people. But now that we're getting used to this, and we kind of know what to do, as long as we have some materials out there that'll control it, it's just another pest that we need to manage, but you gotta be timely with it. You got to be timely. This thing spreads you know, really quick. It was first found in 2013 in Texas, in uh, Louisiana, they had a bunch of problems. Since then, it's moved all the way up. They were having bad problems in Kansas this year. When I went to Kansas, I took my son youth hunting in September. At 70 miles an hour, I could see the honeydew in the field. And while I was up there, I wound up giving three talks to co-ops. They thought at that time, and I'm not throwing Kansas you know, under the bus at all, but that it, the message had not made it to that area how bad this was. And they thought it was just a harvest problem. Uh, so they didn't realize. They took tremendous yield loss up there, and it was just simply because, you know, it was new to them, but they took a big, big, big hit in southeast Kansas last year, no doubt. Uh, this is just 2014, how quickly it spread through Mississippi. This is some of the stuff that you can get. Early in the season, it tends to seem like this aphid, you know, of course, you, you make it almost to boot, a little maybe a week, 10 days before boot, before you see treatments break. When you first start finding this aphid, you need to increase your scouting to a twice a week. I know it's a pain, uh, consultants, you know, having to double back on 500 acres of grain sorghum, but it's a must. And once you get to about the third week of July, that's when things just seem to really intensify. And they can go from, you know, just a little bit of an issue to, you know, seven to 10 days, 
you know, it can go across the field. So you got to increase the frequency of the visits uh, to the field. And what we're telling people right now, there's a lot of people working on this across the, the, the whole South. Anybody that's growing grain sorghum, their state's working on it in some capacity. I like to just get one of the sticks with a sweep net. There's lots of methods. And walk out there, stick it under the canopy, and lift and walk fast. And I'm not worried about finding one aphid. I want to find that cluster, which you can find really, really fast. And once you find them, that's when you need to start stepping up your scouting a little bit. And that seems to be very, has been very successful for, for us so far, so far. But this is actually the difference in a seed treatment and no seed treatment on some late planted stuff. Um, this is actually some stuff I just let go and they killed it. But I mean, again, that's just seeing what they will do. The pre-boot stage, I think is, it can all be bad, but the pre-boots, or I say pre-boot, about boot before the head before panicle emergence can be the worst um, because it can keep the head from emerging and some some of you agronomist type probably know a lot more about this i'm assuming it just takes a lot of energy for a plant in a boot stage to push a panicle out and when you get a lot of aphid pressure some kind of stress on the stress the, it fails the head and the whole fields will not head and you'll see this it's very obvious if they if you get an infestation that gets bad prior to heading this is not uncommon so uh, if you let it alone, you think it's, you know, it's over, a month later it'll stick out ahead. Best I can tell though, it only does about a third of what the normal yield will be, but it will put another head out by the flag leaf uh, if you leave it alone, because the aphids leave after they kill it and it'll, it'll come back, uh, believe it or not, but it, it's almost not worth it. Now this, this is something, the first thing that we did in 2014, myself and Jeff Gore just started putting out a bunch of tests. We needed to understand the potential yield loss with this thing so we could figure out how aggressive we need to be. This is only seven trials, but it was some sprayed, unsprayed stuff. So basically what this is, and I made up this stage by the way, I don't think that's a real stage. It's basically a week before for boot roughly. But our, our, during this period, and this is due to non-heading, if a population hit that stage, hit that stage grain sorghum at about 20 at a 20 percent level, that's when it hit 20 percent level. Was at that stage we saw 81 to 100 percent yield loss when there was no treatments made. At the boot stage, we had a couple of different tests there. It ranged 50 to 70 percent. When the head was coming out, if we hit 20% aphids at that point, now you're assuming at this point that they're going to get worse, but that's just when it hit 20%. It was up to 67. This is the one, though, that I'm more concerned about right here because this seems to affect the bigger number of acres. Even at the soft dose stage, if when these populations hit a 20% level at as late as soft dough, we still saw a 20% yield loss. So you have the potential to lose yield with this thing all the way up till you get the hard dough. And then you run into some other issues, which like, like uh, harvest problems. I got another video I'd love to show y'all, but the way that last one did, I, I actually got time. I think I'm gonna show y'all, but it's aggravating. I'm trying to get this thing to... I'm looking at two screens here, that's the problem. But the reason I think this is important, this video, so I have a grad student that loves to do videos and pictures and he's really feeding my extension program a tremendous amount of, of stuff for educational purposes. So I'm supporting his habit by buying him all this film gear. But this is time lapse over two days. We was walking in these grain sorghum fields, we kept finding all these lady beetles in the head and honeydew, but never any aphids. So he put up a, t a camera that was taking pictures every minute for two days. One of the things we found out is these aphids at night are going into the heads and at daylight they're moving down. They're moving all over this plant. There's not much going on here. This is noon if you look. You see that? They're moving a little bit, but there's not a lot really going on right now. The aphids are, the heat's keeping them pushed down in the canopy. Now this is, I believe, in uh, mid to late August. And you can see right now we're at two o'clock. Uh, no, is that right? I hate military time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we're kind of getting into the day, but the aphids, there's a little bit of movement. Now just, just kind of watch this. And this is a decent population in this field. You can see the honeydew in the background. 
But I want you to see this. At 1800 hours, which is about 6 o'clock, you can see the wind dies. We're starting to get a little darker. Look at the activity. This is amazing. This was eye opening to us. It's explained some stuff. Now we're getting to the next morning. Look what's coming back out of the head. So when we talk about harvest problems, the problems with harvest and honeydew is the aphids in the head. So it may, be a, it may be that you really need to focus what's in the plant, not worry about what's in the head, because if it's in the bottom of the plant, it's probably still going to the head. And this, this was really eye-opening for us, and I figured it was worth, worth y'all seeing. And we're going to do a lot more work with this now that we kind of understand it. But I thought that that was a, a fairly neat video. And this is just day two, but it's the, it's the, exact, the exact same same thing. Makes me wonder what happens if you spray at night. Well, we're, we're interested in that, well, that as well. As to some say, degree. The, the good side of that is that egg is moving around, so it's going to move through insecticide. If you right. made a spray, that's probably going to improve your control if you have a decent insecticide. This picture actually come out of Texas. I think they were cutting some, some forage sorghum or something. But, you know, there's pictures of combines out of Arkansas, and there were some. This is just, this is aphids. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Around College Station, uh, not this year but last year, the forage sorghum was hit doubly hard, and literally it took down the entire field. There wouldn't even work for the combine. Yep. We had to completely disassemble the whole threshing. Oh, there, okay. The combine in Louisiana two years ago. Uh, well, so. So let's let's talk about. I'm just gonna I'm gonna skip through. Let's <coughs> let's end on this. Talk about this this for a minute. Um. So when it comes to recommendations, and Scott Stewart's in here, uh, but we're all on the exact same page, really we have two, we have two options. We have Savanto by Bayer, which performed extremely well this past year, and we have Transform, we think. So Transform's been a Section 18 for the last couple of years. Some of you may know that uh, the Pollinator Stewardship Council and some, and some other groups filed a lawsuit against the EPA um, something around the labeling of transform or cefloxiflor. Uh, this was filed in the Ninth Circuit in California. The judge basically ruled that the EPA give an unconditional registration uh, with some lacking data on bee health or bee safety or, or so forth. So EPA vacated the transform label uh, back in maybe November, or I can't remember. So that counts for, I mean, basically there is no label, no current label for cotton or grain sorghum right now. Um, we are allowed to try to, to get Section 18s, uh, but that's a very important tool. Nobody wants to go into to grain sorghum if you're a company with no, of no products or only one product because of the, the, the hint of resistance. So if you're bare, which they have a full label, I think they would probably like some rotation with Transform and vice versa. So we're all applying for Section 18s. We don't know whether they'll be granted or not, but the EPA does know that this is a priority for our growers because they don't have a lot of options. Um, we're actually going to, to D.C. to visit with them uh, next week to try to find out what we need to do to get, to get this ball rolling. But that's basically our options in our mind is Transform and Savanto. Transform's hanging out there right now, and we'll need a Section 18. You hear things about dimethylate and chlorpyrifos. I'm just going to tell you, it's, we're not recommending it. There are situations where it looks okay, but there's a lot where it does not. And the data is just too variable for us to have any of those two products. I'm not saying it won't beat the populations back, but I have some examples of my own self where if I would have made that, that recommendation like a, a quart of Corpirifos, I would have cost the guy's whole farm. So there are situations where it's worked and there are situations where it has not. Where they seem to work is where you let them get already really bad and then you put a test out and they're on the downhill swing anyway. And we see that with a lot of pests. But on the front side, on an, in, on an increasing population where they're about to take off, and that's where our thresholds line up with, we only have confidence right now in, in Transform and Savanto. And we really need both of them very badly to rotate in and out. Um, so that's our options. The other thing is early planting. That's still probably, you know, within the recommendation. Now, keep in mind, I don't mean like March beans, you know, but, but on the early side. Uh, we're doing a bunch of work with plant populations. And 
I didn't see what I thought I was going to see this year. There was somewhat of a difference. But in 2014, we did see a, a lower aphid numbers where we had higher thick rank growth, whether it was twin rows or, or, or narrow row plantings or so forth compared, compared to lower seeding rates. So, so going into this year, if you decide to plant grain sorghum, I would try to plant on the earlier side. I would definitely use a seed treatment and I would definitely have somebody looking at those acres. Whether it's you or a consultant you hire or whoever, somebody has got to look at those acres. And, and don't just key everything around sugarcane aphids. If you're in the Mid-South, you really need to be watching for, for midge just as much uh, going into that. Pre-harvest is the, is the last thing I'm going to mention. Uh, Transform has a 14-day pre-harvest interval, so it really fits that harvest interval window pretty good. Savanto's 21 days. Um, Try to, if you're going to put a desiccant out, I would advise you to, when you hit black layer, you know, up and down the head, to try to get it out more on the early side rather than the late, because as long as there's green tissues, aphids keep building. Um, that program, it seems to be really good. One of the biggest questions that we all have right now is when do you need to apply a insecticide with your desiccant versus not putting one with a desiccant? And that's what we don't have a really good handle on right now. If you have aphids down low in the canopy or 50 or more on a flag leaf, we're saying do it. But I don't have tremendous confidence that every time that would have meant you would have had a problem. But if you break down, if one farmer in five break a combine down, clog the throat on the turn row, you know, it's probably the, the it's worth, worth doing because it's a big issue. With that, I'll end. We got several minutes. Uh, we got, well, actually, I'm out of time, but unless you got a quick question. Um, any questions at all? What uh, about on the Savanto thing? Is what kind of residual are you getting out of it? We're getting a little more with the Savanto than we are with the Transform, but, you know, what's 50% control at eight days? versus 10, 50% of a million is still a lot. So, but there is no question that the trend, not just in Mississippi, but all the states have seen a little longer residual with Savanto. So what that means right now, I'm not sure. The biggest thing is try to, you know, use the right tips, the right pressure, the right water volumes and all that, and get the very best initial control that you can to, to keep that population from rebounding, you know, I wouldn't have to worry so much about the residual. Try to get your best initial kill that you can to keep what you leave in the field from blowing back quicker. Um, but it, I, I mean, I don't have a great answer for you. It's not like you're going to get three weeks with this one and two with this one. I can just tell you it's a little long. We have, it's just been too early. We've only had this pest for a couple of years. Well, I had a trial out, but we put it out, and two weeks later we came in with the 